Well, today we are jumping back into our series, Follow Me, as we're looking through the Gospel of Mark. So I hope you brought a Bible with you. If you are back at church, maybe for the first time in a long time, maybe you're not even a follower of Jesus, you you don't know where a Bible is, and we'll have one on the screen in front of you. But I want everyone to pull out Mark, the Gospel of Mark. That's the second book in the New Testament, and we're gonna be in chapter two. So today we're gonna look at verses one through 17. And I think it has some real life application for all of us. But in honor of God, whether you're in your den at home or here on campus, let's all stand together. And let me read for you as you follow along. Mark chapter two, verse one through 17. When Jesus came back to Capernaum a few days later, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer space, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And some people came, bringing to him a man who was paralyzed, carried by four men. And when they were unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after digging an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralyzed man was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and thinking over in their hearts, why does this man speak this way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins except God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were thinking that way within themselves, said to them, why are you thinking about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man? your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the night in the sight of everyone. So they were all amazed and were glorifying God saying, we have never seen anything like this. And he went out again by the seashore and all the people were coming to him and he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax office and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And it happened that as he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them and they were following him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating with tax collectors and and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Father, we pray that in the moments we have to study your word today, that your spirit would convict us where we need to be convicted, inspire us where we need to be inspired, teach us where we need to be taught. And God, may we live this out. And we'll pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Yay. (laughs) You keep it coming. I love it. I do want to mention every single week we, we have uh, printouts for you if you want to take notes with us. We now also have a digital version, so you can go online or our website and just download it on your phone or your iPad, and you can just type the notes if that's easier for you Sunday and uh, each and every Sunday. But today we're continuing the series that we have called Follow Me. We're looking through the Gospel of Mark. We're not going to look at every single passage in the Gospel of Mark, but for 14 weeks, we're pulling out lessons of discipleship. What's it look like to be a true follower of Jesus? What's it look like to have the heart of Jesus? What's it look like in this crazy world in which we live to actually live out the commands of Jesus? So at home, you're reading through the Gospel of Mark, and here on Sundays, we are studying some of the passages in the book of Mark. Today, I've entitled this message, How to Talk About Jesus. So in this passage, we're gonna look at how Jesus talks about himself 
and the lessons that we can learn about talking about Jesus to a skeptical world. I also wanna mention that this Thursday, if, if you have some time, you can jump online. It'll be on our Facebook page at noon. We're gonna do a round table discussion on this subject, how to talk about Jesus. I'll be there, uh, Lee Taylor, Ricky Wheeler, and Brady from our staff team will be there. We're just gonna have a round table discussion of what are some practical ways that we can get better at sharing Christ with our friends, with our neighbors, with our coworkers uh, in this day and age. If you can't watch it at noon, we'll put it on our YouTube channel and you can watch it later. But we're gonna do that this Thursday. Also, maybe you would say, hey, someone talked to me about Jesus and now I wanna follow him and I wanna be baptized. Next Sunday, we're gonna be baptizing people. So if that's your next step, next Sunday is the day to do it. And in fact, you can just go to our website, uh, johnsonferry.org slash connect. And there you can find uh, how to uh, get the information that you need. And we would love, we would love to see you take that next step next week. But we're looking at a passage that I think really captures the heart of Jesus. I found that when it comes to talking about evangelism, which is just the way of saying, you know, talking about Jesus to people, I think we often want tips, strategies, how-to, and that's important. We'll look at some of those today. But the most important thing we need to grasp is the heart of Jesus. What is his heart? If we look at verse 17 of this text, you see that he uses his analogy. He says this, in fact, I'll just read it again, verse 17. He says, Jesus said to them, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's an appropriate analogy. Think about a doctor. And these men and women who are doctors are certainly heroes uh, in, in this time of, of history with a pandemic. And we so appreciate all of those in the medical profession. But think about a doctor will spend most of his or her time with people who are sick. That's not to say that they won't have preventative appointments with people to do physical exams and that kind of thing. But most of the people they see are people that have some kind of issue, some kind of problem, and they're coming to the doctor for help. So the doctor's focus is mostly on people who know they need help from the doctor. And this is the condemning word Jesus is saying to the religious people of his day. And I didn't come to focus on people who don't think they need me. I came to focus on the people that need me. I didn't come to focus on people who think they're righteous, although we'll find out they're not really righteous as motivated by the things they're motivated by. I came for sinners. So, so what we're trying to grasp at is like a doctor who has a passion for people who want to get well, Jesus has a passion for people who need to know him. And, and we grasp here the heart of of Jesus. This brings him joy. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Our staff team right now is reading a book called Gentle and Lowly. It's actually based on the writings of a Puritan from the uh, 15 or 1600s. But it's a fascinating book because it gets at the heart of Jesus. And in that book, the author uses this analogy. And, and I think this paints a picture for us of the heart of Jesus. In fact, I'll just read what he wrote. Imagine this scenario. A compassionate doctor has traveled deep into the jungle to provide medical care to a primitive tribe afflicted with a contagious disease. Does that sound familiar, by the way? He has had his medical equipment flown in. He has correctly diagnosed the problem and the antibiotics are prepared and available. He is independently wealthy and he has no need of any kind of financial compensation. But as he seeks to provide care, the afflicted refuse. They want to take care of themselves. They want to heal on their own terms. Finally, a few brave young men step forward to receive the care being freely provided. And what does the doctor feel? Joy. Increasing joy. His joy increases to the degree that the sick come to him for help and helping. It's the whole reason he came. And how much more joy if the diseased are not strangers on some primitive island, but his own friends and family. And here's his point. So with us and so with Christ. Think about this. Jesus does not get frustrated and he doesn't get flustered when we come to him for forgiveness, for fresh forgiveness, for pardon with distress and in need and with emptiness. He, he doesn't get frustrated at that. In fact, he says, that's the point. That's why he came. 
Did you know that, that Jesus loves to forgive you? Some of you need to hear that. God loves to forgive you. That is his heart. And Jesus doesn't want to just forgive you. Jesus wants you. He wants you. He, want to has a, he wants to have a relationship with you. And see, when it comes to doing ministry in Jesus' name, we don't need to just pick up some strategies for Jesus. What we need first and foremost is we need the heart of Jesus. We need to live like Jesus. We need to be like Jesus. And we need to have his heart. And I love this passage today because it's such a wonderful, practical look at the heart of Jesus and how he interacted with people that were far from him. And there's a lot in this passage that I need to look at for my life to think about. Jesus, how do you want me to live and how do you want me to interact with people who are far from you? So today's gonna be super practical, okay? Every week I've asked you in your journal to, to go into it reading with two questions in mind. Every time you read a passage in Mark, number one, what does this teach me about Jesus? And number two, what does it mean for me? So what do I see Jesus doing in this passage? And the two is kind of the so what. So what does that have to do with my life? So let's just break this down in a very practical message. Let's spend the first half talking about what we see from Jesus. And then we'll flip the coin and we will then talk about what that means for you living your life. All right, does that sound good to you? If it doesn't, too bad, I'm the one preaching. So here we go. All right, number one. First of all, let's just look at that. Okay, as we look at this passage and as I try to observe what's happening here, what do I see Jesus do? I think there are four things that he does in this passage. Number one, Jesus speaks the gospel. He speaks the gospel. Verse one and two. It says that when Jesus came back to Capernaum a few days later, and it was heard that he was at home, Many gathered together. So there was no longer any space, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. This is a fascinating look because it, it tells us that Capernaum was where Jesus lived. He was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, but here as an adult, Capernaum was his home. Now the Bible doesn't tell us anything, but it's just fascinating to think about that they're at Jesus's Home. Now, maybe he was in the home of someone else, but it, but it almost reads as if this is his home. And do you ever wonder, by the way, what Jesus' home looked like? I mean, you know, his dad was a carpenter, so I'm sure he has some pretty sweet shelves and stuff like that. I mean, I don't know what his house looked like, right? But, but he's at home in Capernaum, and he's doing what he always does. He's teaching, and crowds are coming from, you know, all over the place to hear him. And it says here at the end of verse two that, that as they gathered around, he was speaking the word to them. What does that mean, the word? It could mean a general reference to scripture. Jesus was opening up the scriptures to them. Of course, at that time would have been the old, what we would now call the Old Testament, those 39 books of the Old Covenant. But I think it's more precisely what he's already demonstrated in Mark, and that's the message that we saw in chapter one, verse 15. Because every single time Jesus preached, this was his centralized message. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We talked about that last week, but the kingdom of God now is in front of you. The Messiah you've been waiting for is talking to you. God is doing something in this moment. So you can't just be neutral to it. You have to do something with it. Well, what do you do with it? Jesus says two things, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. To repent is to turn from this way and to turn to Jesus. And so if some of you today are not followers of Jesus, what do you need to do? You need to repent and believe in Jesus. Trust your life into the hands of Jesus. If you are already a follower of Jesus, what do you need to do? Get guess what? You need to also repent and believe in Jesus. Not because you're not saved or you need to get saved again, but repentance is a daily action of turning from my way and turning to Jesus's way. And so some form or fashion, Jesus is gathering around these people and he's teaching about the kingdom of God, about what God's doing in this moment and what true repentance and belief look like. He's speaking the gospel, the good news. All right, two, what else do we see in this passage? Number two, I, I want you to see that Jesus sees the deeper need. 
He sees the deeper need. So apparently on this very crowded afternoon in his house, a couple men heard that he was there. Jesus had grown a reputation for being a great healer. As we just talked about, you know, I want the healing. We just sang that. And they have a a friend who is paralyzed and we don't know much about him, his name. We don't know if he was in some tragic accident. Was he born so that he couldn't walk? We, We don't know. We just know he's paralyzed. And they're thinking, hey, if Jesus is here and he's right around the corner and I know where his house is, let's get you to Jesus. There's four men pick up their friend and what an act of, of courage and love and compassion. They put him on a mat and they walk to Jesus, but guess what? They can't get in. There are people everywhere. They can't even get through the door. So what do they do? They get up on the roof of the house. As you look at history, we, we know that the roofs in Jesus' day were thatched roofs. Maybe not so much like those kind of African huts that you would see, but more elaborate than that. They would put different raw materials together to make a pretty decent, you know, thick roof. And so when the text tells us they had to dig through the roof to get to Jesus, you can see that it took quite a bit of work to kind of lower someone down through this roof. And I just wonder for the people in the den who are hearing Jesus, they're sitting there listening to Jesus and all of a sudden they start to feel dust and to hear cracks and to feel things crumbling. Now, I'll just be honest because I get in front of crowds like this every single week I've had lots of times where I can tell that I'm speaking and people are distracted. (laughs) I bet they were distracted in that moment with Jesus. But I've I've had times like that. Maybe there there was a medical emergency in the room and you're up here talking and you see everyone's head looking somewhere else and you just, after a while, just have to stop talking and make sure you attend to whatever need is happening in the room. I've had it where, you know, people did strange things like walk in front of the, the church before or walk to the stage and everyone gets a little nervous. You try to, I've, I've had things like that before. And then there's just been some crazy, funny things that happen in churches all the time. In fact, one of my favorite that I heard about Johnson Ferry a number of years ago, Mark Cottingham, some of you were there for this. He's, it's Christmas Eve. He's singing a holy night. And if you know Mark, he sings it every Christmas like three billion times, right? So he's, he's up there, he's got a play button on his back. You sit play and he's, oh, you know, it just comes out. And, and he's up here singing, oh, holy night. Well, this candle, the advent wreath is probably over here somewhere. It's been burning all day. Those candles are getting low, so low that they touch the greenery. So here's what's happening. Mark's on this stage singing, you know, oh, holy night. And guess what? The advent wreath is brightly shining at this point. So it's, it's, it's up in flames. And of course, no one at this point is looking at Mark. They're looking at the advent wreath and, and some people had to go and get a bunch of water and put it out. And, and look, we, if you speak for a living or get in front of a people like this all the time, things like that happen. But I can promise you, I have never been teaching. And all of a sudden in the roof, there was a hole and a man was lowered down. And yet that's what they did for their friend to get him to Jesus. Why are they there? They want healing. But Jesus knows they need the healer. See, Jesus sees the deeper need. You you would think that the first words out of his mouth would be, walk, take your pallet, and go home. But he says something different. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. See, we have the heart of Jesus here because we see what's priority for Jesus. The walking's important. The walking is amazing. But there's actually something deeper that you need than what you think you need, and it is forgiveness. Did you know that Jesus knows the deepest needs of your heart? Sometimes you think you know what you need, but Jesus knows what you actually need, and he sees the deeper need. Well, let's keep traveling along the story. What do we see next? We see, thirdly, that Jesus confronts his opposition. If you read verse 6 through 12, we see that we have people who oppose Jesus. And the oddest thing, especially if you're new to the Bible and you're reading for the first time, you're going, oh, hold on, wait a minute. The scribes are like the Bible people, right? I mean, they're, they're the religious experts. So why are they and Jesus in conflict And that's a question you need to ask again and again as you read the Gospel of Mark because that conflict is gonna grow and grow and grow. And so apparently, people who thought they were religious and close to God actually weren't close to God because they opposed directly the things of Jesus. And they're mad because they're thinking, look, look, 
There's only one God, and who are you to say that you can forgive sins? No one can do that but God. That is blasphemy. In fact, that's what they put Jesus up for in his trial, blaspheming against God. And Jesus said, well, let me, let me ask you a question. Which one is harder to say? Your sins are forgiven, or rise, take your, mallet, take your pallet, and, and walk? Which, which one of those is easier? Well, you can say both of them pretty easy. I, I just did. It took, what, you know, seven seconds? I mean, it, it's not hard to say those things, but which one is harder? Well, the harder one is the walk one. Because I can say to you right now, your sins are forgiven, but we don't see that happening. I don't know what's happening in your heart. And honestly, it's not mine to say, but if, but if I were to look at one of you right now and say, all right, you're paralyzed, get up and walk right now. Guess what the burden is on me at that moment to prove that what I say can come true. But Jesus says there's actually something more important than him walking. And it's something that I and I alone as God have the power to do. And that's to say, your sins are forgiven. And we see that the, those who are religious are at odds with the one who created religion, Jesus. And they would go toe to toe and Jesus said, I want you to know that as the son of man, which is the title that he often gave himself, as the son of man, I alone have the authority to forgive sins. Jesus is not just a rabbi, he's not just a teacher, he's not just a great example. This is one of many moments where he is saying, I am God. So what do we see in this text? He speaks the gospel. He sees the deeper need of people. He, he, he has opposition. And this is a fourth one that something I, I just love about Jesus. And that's that he associates with sinners. If you go to verse 13 and then the 14, you, you see that a new character emerges. His name is Levi. And Jesus goes up to Levi. Some people think this is also Matthew, it may be, but we'll just say Levi. He goes up to Levi and he says to him the same thing that he said last week to those two sets of brothers. Remember that when he walked up to Andrew and Simon, who was later Peter, then he walked up to James and John all fishing. And he said, hey guys, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He walks up now to Levi, a tax collector, says the same thing, hey, follow me. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's collecting these people who follow him. And you think, well, isn't that neat? What's the big deal with that? Well, the big deal with that is that Levi is not just some ordinary dude on the side of the road. Levi is a tax collector. See, in those days, they had direct and indirect taxes. We do the same thing, honestly, now. Direct taxes are those that we pay directly to the federal government. Indirect taxes are taxes we pay through other means, like businesses and, and other things who pass their taxes on to us. And you know, when we pay for a certain item, we pay taxes on that that indirectly goes to the government. Well, in, in the day and age in which Jesus lived, the way that Rome got its taxation from the people is they would hire people to get the money for them. And often it went to the highest bidder. The person who would say, hey, I can collect this amount of taxes. Well, that person would get the right to then collect the taxes, which is all well and good, but Th this was seen as treasonous by the Jewish people because he's not just some random guy. His name is Levi. He, he's, he's Jewish. And yet in his profession, he has sided with Rome instead of with Israel, the covenant people of God. And yet who does Jesus hang out with? Levi. And, and Levi apparently having his life changed by Jesus, says, Jesus, come over to my house. And so he, he has a party for him. Now, now the word for that he ate with him or that he dined with him in the text there, it's the word that was reserved for a banquet. So this isn't just, hey, pop by my house, you know, we'll grab a couple sandwiches before we head back out on the road. No, no, he, he held a feast for him and not just a feast, but Levi invites all his, all his buddies to come over with him who are also tax collectors and sinners. And that just got all over the religious people of the day. How in the world, Jesus, can you spend your time with people who are immoral, who are filthy, who don't care about the law, who are traitors? And isn't it something that those are the people Jesus to spend his time with. Jesus loved to be around people far from him 
And you know what's also fascinating? People far from God love to be with Jesus. Do people far from God love to be with you? You know, in this text, as so many texts, we, we see that Jesus changes lives. He changed Levi's life. He still does that today. We had our deacons retreat Friday and Saturday. It was just, it was really just amazing. And, and my favorite part of that retreat is that all the, the guys who are new deacons this year, they all have to share their testimony. And so they get up in front of everybody and they give about a five to six minute testimony of how God has changed their life. And, and these are guys that from the outside looking in, you think, oh, they got it all together. They've never made mistakes. They're successful, you know, all those things. And then one after one happens every single time. You, you hear that there was a time in their life when alcohol or other things had a grip on their heart and Jesus changed their life. Or maybe they grew up in church and they had religion down, boy. They had going to church down, boy. They had following the rules down, but they did not personally know Jesus and he changed their life. We heard stories about marriages that, that had broken, yet God restored them in Christ. We, we heard about people who had very, very difficult childhoods through neglect and abuse and other things and how Jesus changed lives. And I wanna tell you something, that the same Jesus who changed their life is the same Jesus who can change your life. Amen? <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, like you, you are not just some collection of DNA and molecules that's just, you know, taking up space in the planet. You know, no, you are someone that God made, that someone he made in his image, that he loves. And yes, you are a sinner. Yes, you have failed his commandments. Yes, you have not trusted him. But guess what? God loves you so much that he sent his son to die on a cross for you and to raise from the grave for you so that you not only could have an eternal life with God, but you could have meaning now you can have purpose now. You can have something greater to live for now. And God invites you into the story that he is writing in your life so that you can be a part of what God wants to do through you. Jesus does not simply want to forgive you. Jesus wants you. Amen. Do you know that? Jesus wants you. And that's his, that's his heart. He doesn't tolerate us. He's not like, well, if I, gotta, if I gotta forgive him, I guess I will. But he's hanging out with tax collectors. He's hanging out with sinners because he wants you. So here's the question. If, if Jesus is doing that, how do I do that? How do I talk to people about Jesus? Well, we have just a few minutes left. So let me just give you a few very practical things. How, how do I talk about Jesus? And the first one might be the most important for some of you to realize, and it's this. Number one, here it is. You know how you talk about Jesus? First of all, you realize that you are not Jesus. Amen? Amen, preacher. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right? You are not Jesus. Some of you, that's the only reason you came today. You need to hear that. You are not Jesus. Because here's what you think. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess if I had the power to forgive people or I can make, you know, paralyzed people walk, I mean, yeah, then I, I would do all that too, but I'm not Jesus. And you know what? You're not Jesus. You know what that means? That means if you're gonna be effective at sharing the gospel, you can't do it in your own power. You're not Jesus. You need his power. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to depend on him, not just your amazing persuasive abilities. If people don't share the gospel regularly, it's because they have one of three problems. They either have a knowledge problem, an opportunity problem, or a fear problem. The knowledge problem is they don't know how to share the gospel. All right, we can teach you how. This Thursday, we're gonna teach you how. But most of you know how to share the gospel. Number two, it might be an opportunity problem. I don't know anybody who needs to hear about Jesus. We're gonna talk about that in a minute too. But let's be honest, for most of us, it's number three. The reason most of us don't regularly talk to people about Jesus is because we have a fear problem. A fear of man, a fear of being looked at a certain way. And that's why you need Jesus. You need his power. Let me tell you something. We will never drift towards sharing Jesus. We will always drift away from it. So we have to keep coming back to Jesus saying, I need your power, I need your help. I can't do this without you. That's why we pray the Bob prayer. Remember that, we talked about that last you know what, a couple months ago. Anybody here named Bob? Anybody? 
right there? It's not about you. All right, so this, this is, is that Bobby Smith right there? It is Bobby Smith. This is certainly not about you, but what's the Bob prayer? The Bob prayer is we get up every day and we pray this, B-O-B. God, give me a burden, give me today a burden to tell people about Jesus, an opportunity to share the gospel, and a boldness with which to share it. Burden, opportunity, boldness. Burden, opportunity, boldness. We need his power, all right? Number two, we're gonna talk about Jesus. Number two, we need to know and share the gospel. We need to know what the gospel is, the good news of Jesus, this whole thing about the kingdom of God. What is that? We need to know what that is. But we also have to share it. Sometimes this quote is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, though he probably did not actually say this, but it says something like this. Let me make sure I get it right. He says, always share the gospel and when necessary, use words. Now, that sounds great, but let me tell you, that's a lie. Because you can't share the gospel without words. Now, now don't get me wrong, your lifestyle matters. You know, people are watching the way you, you act, the things you post, the way you live. People are watching that. So, so that stuff does matter, but, but to accurately share the gospel, it means that words have to come out of your mouth. Jesus Christ as he was ministering to people, it said that he, he was speaking the word to them. We have to not only know the gospel, but we have to speak the gospel. And that makes sense. Could you imagine if there was a, a young man who had fallen in love with a, with a young lady and he thought, I want to marry this young woman. I want her to be my wife, but I'm just too scared to ask her. Maybe she'll figure it out by my lifestyle. Do you think that would work? I mean, he could serve her, he could, he could buy her gifts, he could even sit at the restaurant where the TV is to his back, which is like amazing, you know, that he would do that for her. I mean, he, he, he could do all kinds of stuff and just smile and hope that she would kind of get it. <laughs> but the reality is, in, unless he asks her, she'll never say yes. Now, I'm not the Holy Spirit, you're not the Holy Spirit, we can't change lives, but people have to know and hear the gospel from our mouth. So you have to speak the gospel, know it and share it. All right, number three, expect opposition. Expect opposition. All throughout the gospel of Mark, you're gonna see that when Jesus does ministry, there's often opposition from Satan and there's opposition from those who opposed him. And how do you handle that? For us, if we're gonna be people who talk about Jesus with the world that needs to hear about Jesus, it means we're gonna have opposition. Internal opposition, which could be spiritual warfare, Satan, could just be doubts and fears that we have. But also, let's be honest, external opposition. We've talked about this a number of times, but going forward, the pressure to be a Christian is gonna be higher than it's ever been. And we're gonna to have to often go into the seasons of opposition, but we wanna do it faithfully and to love people with the love of Christ. And I, I tell you just as a good reminder, be careful that you don't lose your witness over a mission field that we're trying to reach. You know, sometimes I see people post things online that have to do with politics. And better get, you know, get them liberals, you know, get them socialists, all oh, them Republicans, and them racists. They're getting all, and I'm like, what are you doing? Like that's the mission field. They're, they're watching you. They're, they're reading the stuff that you're posting and it's almost like you're more concerned with proving a political point than you are winning a soul for Jesus Christ. You're gonna have opposition, but don't, don't lower to their level, be Jesus. You know, the only people that Jesus ever confronted were religious people who were self-righteous, who thought they were close to God, who actually weren't. But tax collector sinners, he hung out with them. Expect opposition. Here's the fourth one. It goes with what I just said. Hang out with people who don't know Jesus. All right, what I'm about to tell you is super profound. So take notes. You ready? If you're gonna reach people who are far from God, you have to know people who are far from God. Did you know that? You might wanna write that down. If you're gonna reach people who are far from God, you have to actually know people 
who are far from God. See, what happens in the church is, is this is what we do. Someone comes to know Christ as their Lord and Savior, and it's awesome. And we say, man, what a great decision, and God's working in your life is amazing, and, and it is amazing. And, and, and now we say, hey, we want to disciple you, and here's what happens. We, we invite them to church, or at least we used to before a pandemic, <laughs> remember that? Anyways, we used to invite them to come to church, and they would come to church, right? And, and, and they would get new friends, who, friends who didn't talk like the people at work, who didn't you know, do the same things that people did at work or in their neighborhood or the world or kind of their old life or whatever. And that's great, because it's like, man, I need some accountability. I need some partnership. I need friends in the gospel. And that is good. That's what the body of Christ, we encourage encourage one another, we build one another up. But here's what suddenly happens over time. Instead of building them up to send them out on mission, we build them up. And before long, it's like, well, I, I like the church. And the world's kind of mean. And church people talk like me. And, and Christians act like me. And we have the same values. And, and before long, we become this safe little holy huddle for Jesus, keeping away from the big bad world. Did you ever see Jesus doing that? Because it seems like Jesus was pretty intentional about making sure that on his calendar and in his priorities, that he was with people who are far from God. I mean, honestly, if I said, all right, write the name of two people right now that, that you're friends with who are not believers, could you do it? So if we're gonna reach people far from God, we, we've gotta be around people who are far from God. All right, number five. You're like, when will this be over? All right, number five. Last one, see the deeper need. See the deeper need. You might've heard of Augustine. He was a saint, a great early uh, theologian and writer in the fourth century. He's a, a guy you should study some time because he spent most of the early part of his life just chasing all kinds of stuff. You know, he chased sex, he chased power, he chased philosophy, he chased all kinds of stuff that he thought would finally bring him happiness. A lot of you right now are in that same exact pursuit. If I can just do this, then I'll finally be happy. And, and guess what he found out, what every human has found out, that apart from God, you cannot find the happiness you're looking for. And he, and he said this quote about God he said, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. If you're like me, you know people who don't know Jesus and you see some of the decisions they make and some of the arrogance they might have and some of the, I don't need God, I don't need that, I, got, I can do it on my own, I, you know, and who are you to judge me? You know, all that silly stuff people say. And can I just tell you, look, look beneath that. Because what you really have there is a person who is looking for purpose. They're looking for love. They're looking for meaning. You know what they're really looking for? They're looking for forgiveness. R.C. Sproul is a man who died a few years ago, theologian, writer, teacher. In one of his books, he, he talks about a time when a friend of his who was a psychiatrist down in South Florida offered him a job to come work with him in his psychiatric clinic. And R.C. Sproul, a pastor theologian, kind of like me, would be like, what in the world do you want me doing coming down to work for you, a psychiatrist? Uh, even though he was paying a lot of money, you know, in this offer to do so. And he, and he turned it down, but he asked his buddy, why, why in the world would you want me to come work for you as a psychiatrist? He said, because here's what I found. He said, I found that 95% of my clients, they don't need a psychiatrist. They need a priest because what they're dealing with is unresolved guilt. And they need someone to come up to them and say, no matter what you've done, you are forgiven. Jesus Christ, to this man on a pallet, and to you in the room today and behind the camera today, wants to come up to you and remind you that in him, you are forgiven. And he loves to do it. Isn't that good news? So what we wanna do is just the four or five minutes we have left is we want to pray and we want to sing. 
So I'm gonna set up this prayer and we're gonna pray the Bob prayer. I'm gonna give you a minute or so and you may wanna be thinking about a person in your life who needs to know Jesus. Maybe you don't know that person. And you're gonna pray just, hey, over the next week, God, would you give me a burden? Give me an opportunity, give me the boldness. Let's go into every day this week praying that prayer so that we might not only know Jesus, but speak the things of Jesus to the world. Let's pray together. God, we love you and we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for your heart. We thank you that you love us. God, once we were the people far from you and you saved us. And God, what a privilege we have to tell others about Jesus. God, in this moment that we have in front of us right now, we're about to pray to you and lift up all kinds of prayers to this room or the rooms all over the nation and the world that are watching this right now. And God, we pray you would honor those prayers. God, to give us that burden, that opportunity, that boldness to do something this week, to talk to that person about Jesus. So Lord, in the silence of our own hearts, as we pray to you, hear us now, O oh Father. Father, we've prayed these prayers. We now pray that you would answer. Give us this week those things that we've asked for. Lord, change lives this week. God, as you send us into this mission field, would we be salt and light? Would we speak the things of Jesus? Would we love well? We're, we're gonna do it imperfectly. But Lord, most of all, will we have the heart of Jesus? God, we thank you that Jesus, you, you're a friend of sinners. God, you're a friend of us. None of us in this room deserve you. None of us earned anything that we've gotten from you, but we received it as a gift, the grace that you've given to us. And we're, we're so thankful for it. God, thanks for being our friend. Thank you for not just tolerating us or holding your nose as you forgive us, but thank you for wanting us that we might know you. Thank you for being our friend. We'll pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.